In today's video, we'll be discussing uh, a few interesting radiology cases. Speaker today is Dr. Tejas Kapadia. He is uh, a pediatric radiologist at uh, Royal Manchester Children's Hospital. Uh, uh, that's that's UK, and he his key interest is uh, neuroradiology. But he's currently also leading the body imaging uh, research team. Apart from his regular clinical work, he's uh, he is. Uh, uh, he's a he's a clinical educator. He's he's always been helping uh, radiology residents since his residency. I remember him conducting small sessions for uh, uh, residents when he was at uh, he was in Mumbai. He was practicing in Mumbai. Uh, I think he was a senior resident back then. Along with his current position, he is also uh, at the imaging committee of ESPR Oncology Task Force and multiple other organization currently. Over to you, Tejas. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the kind introduction and for your kind words. Um, I'll just share my screen now. So the topic for today's talk, I thought um, to make it a bit interesting because pediatric radiology in general, many people who practice general radiology find it difficult um, because the presentation is not straightforward most of the times. And Kids are not small adults. They can't speak for themselves. So <clears throat> that is when radiology uh, uh, plays a major role uh, for pediatric uh, uh, treatment and management. So I'll take you through some of the some of the cases in which um, some of them have had very odd presentations, some common, some uncommon pathologies. Um, so. Uh, there, there are questions uh, in a quiz format, and I'll show the questions, and then you can uh, answer those on the chat on my phone. I am see seeing the live chat, so um, welcome everyone, and I hope you enjoy um, the session. So I'll start with the first case: a seven-year-old presented with partial seizures progressing to GTC and had imaging, follow-up imaging after a week, still the patient is not well, bradycardia, hypertensive, partial seizures, not sure what the diagnosis is. Previous, no other similar complaints in the past. So some of, some of the, uh, on some of the slides, I've embedded videos so you can go through them. For example, you can see some abnormality in the right hemisphere on the CT scan. And then you can look at T2 axial, SWI or gradient or hemorrhage sensitive sequence, flare coronal, this is non-contrast, time of flight, MR angio, and diffusion and ADC. So what do you think is the correct answer amongst the options? Is it Sturge-Weber, you think? Is it sarcoidosis? Is it vascular? Is it neoplastic? OK, I see people answering. So this is um, more, more or less a bit confusing case, even for pediatric neuroradiologists. So it's okay if you go wrong or if you're right, that's a bonus, but don't get disheartened at all by uh, whatever your answer is, because these are the challenging ones and we learn from mistakes all the time, every single day. So like I've shown you the CT scan initially and you can see there is a possible there's a curvilinear calcification in, in the uh, region of the circle spaces, not quite sure what's happening there. And then on the MRI, uh, we don't see any obvious hemorrhage on the SWI. TOF sequences on the right side compared to the contralateral side. Uh, if this was in fact, I would have expected attenuation of the cortical arborization of vessels, but in in fact, we see more vessels running on the right uh, on the right side in the right hemisphere. 
so that is a bit of an odd appearance and on uh, diffusion there is obvious restricted diffusion large area of restricted diffusion mostly centered in the right mca territory so overall on presentation this was thought to be possible pediatric ischemic stroke but looking at tof and the clinical presentation it still doesn't fit in so what what so let's see what happened after that um i'll show you some more imaging we didn't do contrast initially think it as it was sent to us as a possible stroke scan was done overnight not monitored by a consultant and thus we had only plain imaging when we did a contrast imaging i'm after a week i'm showing you follow up after one month just to show you the extent of the pathology we see extensive thickening uh, and soft tissue not only uh, limited to the cervical spaces but we see like a plaque of enhancing soft tissue around the right cerebral hemisphere and then uh, comparatively it, um this again doesn't fit in into um <clears throat> stroke so now do you think your possible diagnosis would change based on this right so this was then biopsied and this turned out to be atrt or atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumor this is an embryonal who grade 4 tumor this type of presentation is not very common but lately we are seeing such similar cases coming up so i'll take you through atrt um atrt is a grade 4 tumor and um it is not very common but in infancy it is one of the most common malignant cns tumor uh it is associated with ini1 uh and smart b1 mutation um so it is important to remember these terminologies if you are going to practice as a pediatric neuroradiologist otherwise in a multidisciplinary team meeting you would be clueless when something like this is said um imaging usually it presents as a hemispheric mass or a posterior fossa lesion heterogeneous on t2 with dark t2 areas uh shows heterogeneous enhancement uh necrosis and also restricted diffusion so um commonly like i said the locations so this was post chemotherapy at uh 3 months follow up at 6 months and then follow up at 1 year you can see tremendous improvement with almost disappearance of the previously seen thick plaque like enhancing disease um so other common sites like i showed you uh one previously a hemispheric uh atrt this is another one which appears quite heterogeneous there are areas of hemorrhage in it shows heterogeneous enhancement again and areas of restricted diffusion so um this was confirmed on biopsy again as atrt uh, and this is again a more commoner appearance of atrt in the posterior fossa in the cp angle and can present um with uh with a cystic component as well like in this case we have a solid and cystic component so it can be quite confusing when you start off looking at this brain tumors in your practice because post contrast enhancement appearance like this textbook says solid cystic lesion in the posterior fossa with enhancing component is a pilocytic astrocytoma but then you always need to look at diffusion if it is restricting it is definitely not a pilocytic astrocytoma and for pediatric brain tumors the only sequence which tells you the most about the lesion or the who grade of the lesion is diffusion weighted imaging so use of diffusion weighted imaging for pediatric brain tumors is top of the charts and most of the uh, characteristic base is based on dwi so the other common differential for this appearance is a medulloblastoma however they generally don't have such large cystic component and they can present similarly uh, in the cerebellar pontine angle system so it is important to keep in mind the various presentations of this particular entity <coughs> i'm showing you a companion case 
um so in this companion case you can see uh, again there is involvement of the right hemisphere thick plaque like enhancement not only limited laterally but also goes along the interhemispheric fissure the enhancement is thick however it's not nodular like it was in a previous case and then the restricted diffusion is very very subtle however the calcifications are the classical presentation which which you would see uh, in this particular entity associated with some brain atrophy as well on the ipsilateral side so the, you can see widening of the sulcal spaces uh, and um, these classic calcifications uh, gyral calcifications etc with no abnormality on top of angio so this was this is a classic presentation of sturge weber syndrome um, again in the first few years of life it can be difficult to pick up sturge weber syndrome as they might not have gyral calcification or show enhancement like this however sometimes uh, in some of the papers they have mentioned swi imaging uh, and post contrast plays a role which might pick up some very subtle enhancement but again in suspicious cases of sturge weber first year of life normal scan it is always important to follow it up with another scan uh, at uh, uh, six uh, after six months or at two years of age okay ne let's move to the next case so this was a three year old um, who was transferred from iran and initially presented with skull swelling over there he underwent ct and mri of the head and then they found something and then they did a bone scan which showed multiple bone uh, multiple lesions on the bone scan so let's let's go through the images this is a t2 axial and t2 sagittal this is adc which shows obvious restricted diffusion in this thick um uh, in this uh, uh lesion which is based uh, on the skull bone post contrast shows uh, evident enhancement and on non contrast ct appears quite hyper dense again on um on the bone window you can see the bone appears um uh, shows speculated type of a uh, periosteal reaction not much of sclerosis in this area um when the patient came over to us we did whole body mr just to look at what these bone lesions are uh, because he's 3 years old we didn't want to jump and do some nuclear scan again um so we can see there is extensive bony lesions involvement of both the distal femur and on the x ray you can see a permeative pattern of bone involvement with no clear zone of transition or significant soft tissue seen on this however there was some soft tissue swelling around it no periosteal reaction just the permeative pattern which is not only limited to the metadiaphysis but also crosses over and involves the epiphysis similar involvement of the contralateral side and on again the bone window and you can see extensive pelvic bone involvement as well so there are multiple bony lesions and this large skull lesion and everything everything is limited to the bones we looked at uh, adrenal extra adrenal areas parasympathetic chain abdomen pelvis chest neck try to figure out where this is coming from everything everything negative on imaging other than these extensive bony involvement so what do you think should be the next best investigation so i think many many of you have uh, marked urine catecholamines or mibg as the next possible investigation so let's let's see um what we got so the urine catecholamines were positive so bingo uh, most of you have have got uh so should i say later to this amar uh yeah you just switch on your video i switched it off because it was covering a portion of your image okay so you can just thank you all right so the urine catecholamines were positive that prompted us to do mibg scan so anyone what do you what do you think of this mibg what is this appearance called as um where you don't see uptake 
which normally you see in salivary glands or maybe cardiac or hepatic uptake but most of the uptake is limited to the bone. So this is a classical exam case, which you can get. And when you see this MIBG scan, this, this is a super scan uh, where you see most of the uptake, a uh, tracer uptake in the bone, because there is so much uptake in the bone, we don't see uptake much elsewhere. Yeah. So yeah, we're doing well. I am liking the responses. People are awake. <laughs> so, um, then we then the patient was treated and uh, as neuroblastoma, even though we didn't we didn't find anything as uh, as a primary lesion. Um, and post MIBG scan, you can see there is now normal uptake seen in the liver. So this is a right and left. You can see normal uptake in the liver, salivary glands, some excretion in the in the urinary bladder as well, and some uptake in the renal area. So significant improvement compared to the previous scan. We don't, we hardly see any bony uptake now, which was seen previously. So this was indeed a neuroblastoma, which presented with purely bony involvement, no lesion found anywhere else. All right. So let's move to the next case. So these are twins till their time. I keep uh, scanning them every few months. Um, so twin, so one of the twin is absolutely normal, no clinical issues, but twin one, uh, after delivery presented with, uh, hypertension and low cortisol levels. Now, antenatal scans were normal. There was nothing on the antenatal scans. So let's go through the imaging. Let's concentrate on the ultrasound images. And you see this in, uh, diffuse thickening of the adrenal gland in the suprarenal region. If you want to learn adrenal anatomy, scan a neonate or an infant, or maybe any child under two years of age, and you can beautifully see the adrenal to get your eyes set on how the normal adrenal looks like, because in adults, it is quite challenging to pick up adrenal glands. Uh, so in this particular case, the adrenal glands were quite diffusely thickened on both sides. And on the MRI, the stir coronal, you can see the shape of the adrenal is preserved. However, they appear quite heterogeneous um, and uh, there's no restricted diffusion as such. There's T2 shine through. So what is the likely uh, diagnosis in this case is, would you call this a congenital neuroblastoma, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, um, bilateral adrenal hemorrhage or lymphoma? So I can see the answers and most of you think it is possibly congenital adrenal hyperplasia, right? Exactly. That's what even I thought when I looked at it first. Um, but then looking at the scans carefully, you see a lesion in the liver on the ultrasound and then on, uh, on MR as well. And, um, uh, I've not put the corresponding image for ADC, but this showed, uh, this again did not show significant restricted diffusion, but it appears T2 hyper intense. So will this change your diagnosis? Um, do you think, do you, would you, what would you expect this to be not non-restricting again, appearing similar to the adrenal lesions on imaging, uh, other than it appears quite hypo on, uh, on the ultrasound. So, right, um, again, because the diagnosis was not very clear for imaging, we had to go in and do urine catecholamine levels. And the urine catecholamines were positive. Left adrenal was biopsied. Histopath was neuroblastoma. So, this kid had bilateral adrenal neuroblastoma present, presented after delivery. Now, uh, the, the mink status was negative, even though there was lesion in the liver, but because this was a congenital variant with mainly disease limited to the adrenals and the liver, uh, according to some of the studies, if you don't treat them, they can have a tendency to regress by themselves. So I, now, 
uh, this kid is about year and a half year old and i have been following them and everything has disappeared without any treatment so quite surprising yeah i'm sure you you might google about it you won't believe me but yeah i did the same i had to discuss with the oncologist that why are you not treating this kid and the points were valid and we are seeing the results the lesions have disappeared um the adrenals come back to normal size and also the liver lesions have disappeared so uh what is the role of ming status i'll come to it i have i have added it to the description um so i'm showing another companion case to this particular case which i had all which i have already shown so two weeks old baby presented with abdominal distension had a normal antenatal scan so on ultrasound the liver appeared quite heterogeneous there were possible lesions elsewhere and um mri was performed which showed extensive disease on the liver surface involving the liver extensive disease elsewhere in the abdomen the axil and coronal t2 fat uh, t2 fat set or stir sequences you can see there is extensive disease there is a prominent mass lesion near the porta um so this this uh patient was subjected to mibg because the because of the appearance and presentation and you can see extensive uh tracer uptake uh in the areas of this soft tissue lesion seen on the mr so this was again a congenital neuroblastoma so this is just to show the contrast of how congenital neuroblastoma can present if it is adrenal or extra adrenal um and because this case had such extensive disease this case was um treated with um, uh with chemotherapy and uh responded well later on again i'm showing you another companion case a 5 year old presented with limping orthopedic sent it to us saying it is query osteomyelitis because of the way the patient presented and they asked us to do lumbar spine and pelvis mr so on doing that we found extensive lesions now what was missed by the radiographers while doing the scan was this soft tissue uh in the upper abdomen and um we went back and looked at the chest x ray and we saw this extensive areas of calcification in the left upper abdomen so did a ct abdomen and we found a huge mass which was encasing uh vessels pushing them anteriorly and you can see um uh also there was a thrombus um so this was a classic uh, neuroblastoma case and we did mibg found extensive disease in the abdomen and involving the bones as well so this is this was just a companion case to show various presentations so talking about uh neuroblastic tumors they can be adrenal or extra adrenal and can arise from base of the skull all the way going to the pelvis along the sympathetic uh sympathetic trunk so um the three common varieties of neuroblastic tumors are neuroblastoma ganglioneuroma and ganglioneuroblastoma and they all usually arise from neural crest cells um uh, other than these uh common areas uh we can also we have seen neuroblastoma cases uh, with primary neuroblastoma in the testes because sometimes they can have some neural crest cells now there is a new variant of cns fox2 neuroblastoma which is a primary brain tumor with histopathology classical of a neuroblastoma and this has been included in the new 2021 uh, brain tumor classification uh coming back to the common thoracic abdominal neuroblastoma we see it is the most common extracranial tumor in children adrenal is the most common site followed by um neck chest abdomen in children and pelvis um the abdominal neuroblastoma can be adrenal like on in this case we can see left adrenal involvement or uh, uh they can be extra adrenal like in this case we can see this lesion at the level of the renal hilum along the uh sympathetic chain <clears throat> so the presentation uh depends on the site of origin if this patient has metastasis on presentation so can present as a spinal cord compression or horner syndrome secondary to uh skull bone or paranasal sinus 
or intracranial metastasis can have celiac access syndrome when they they have metastasis um, along the celiac axis or the other commoner ones um, this is just to show neuroblastoma at other locations where we can see this extensive disease in the uh, sacral region uh, and the right paraspinal region metastasis again like in the first case which i had showed you which had a right sided uh, large lesion this is similar uh, similar uh, appearance of a neuroblastoma match in the skull and again on mibg we can pick up most of it so any kid who presents with a large skull lytic lesion or there is just sutural diastasis as well think of neuroblastoma metastasis so this is from the exam point of view um imaging wise i have already discussed most of it and most of the neuroblastomas are mibg are picked up on mibg but some can be negative 10 10 to 30 percent of them and some can present with paraneoplastic syndromes so prognostication there are various staging systems i'm not going into the details of it uh, due to time constraint but uh patient age at presentation is is very important so usually less than one year of age they are less aggressive and show good prognosis and more than one year they are usually more aggressive the median age is about 19 months and um there are some tumor oncogenes like uh amar had asked what is the mink status and what is the implication for neuroblastoma so if there is mutation in the mink oncogene and uh, uh, if there is cancerous cell development due to this mutation, then the mass arising from this is more resistant to treatment. And these patients usually have poorer prognosis compared to the mink negative ones. So it can upgrade to the high risk category, um, basically. Again, uh, DNA content is important. This is just another case I added to show uh, a mink negative neuroblastoma large one with extensive skeletal metastasis and follow up an MIBG at one year shows excellent response. The lesion is reduced to this small calcified mass and you see significant improvement or you don't see any skeletal metastasis on the MIBG scan on follow up. So mink negative show good response. Now these calcified mass, if they are complex, other into structures and they are just left behind and not done anything just followed up on ultrasound for a few years this was another quite interesting case siblings the first sibling was a three-year-old the second one six-year-old both had extensive neuroblastomas uh, in the in the thorax and abdomen and this was a familial neuroblastoma uh, syndrome case okay um so let me show you another companion case with this one. Going back to the original case, if you remember bilateral adrenal involvement, which I had shown on the original case three. Now, again, this is another seven day old presenting with sepsis. And then you see enlarged bilateral adrenal glands. They appear quite hyperdense. Uh, however, these are post contrast images, so it is difficult to judge. Uh, in, in, children and neonates we generally do a single contrast phase we don't do non-contrast arterial venous delayed no we don't do all of that we just do a single mixed contrast phase or a bastion protocol which we use commonly for trauma patients wherein we can see both arterial and venous um, venous phases in a single run to reduce the amount of exposure we can we give to the children so coming back to the case large adrenal glands on both sides patient with sepsis lead, which led to coagulopathy and then had a large intracranial hemorrhage and then also had this large bilateral adrenal glands. So the point is that um, if, the, if the shape of the adrenal gland is preserved, then it is usually congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Adrenal hemorrhage can also have preserved shape, but depends on size of the hemorrhage for example in this case the hemorrhage was quite big so we can't say we can't comment on shape of the adrenal gland however 
neuroblastoma which was originally thought to be an thought to be um uh, a lesion which does not preserve the shape of the adrenal gland is now out of the box because like i showed you this case neuroblastoma presented with preserved shape of the adrenal gland which were just enlarged so that logic does not clearly apply uh, and hence urine catecholamines mines is very important um all right let's move to the next case um so a one year old presented with increased work of breathing um normal white cell count esr crp normal no recent illness and the perinatal period was uneventful so this is a first presentation for this kid so you see this chest x ray what will you do next once you see this chest x ray would you mark the report as urgent and ask the registrar or your secretary to inform the clinical team okay we have an we have an urgent case can you look at it within 24 hours whenever you have time or you would pick up the phone and inform the clinician and say look this is a very critical case and needs your urgent attention you need to do something about it right away or you would follow up on imaging in 24 hours to see what is happening to this or you would review the clinical history in detail try to figure out what was the sequence of events how was the presentation and then think what what needs to be done next excellent so most of you have replied uh, correctly that the so this presentation is tension pneumothorax right so you see large uh, pneumothorax in the left hemithorax with displacement of the trachea and mediastinal structures to the contralateral side there is mild widening of the intercostal rib spaces and flattening of the left dome of diaphragm these are all the classical features of tension pneumothorax um, the first thing you should do is treat it as a medical emergency because this pressure needs to be released immediately the i've taken this from one of the articles which shows the common sites where you can put in a needle you can do a needle aspiration the most commonest sites are in the second third intercostal uh, rib space in the mid clavicular line or, or in the uh, fourth fifth uh, intercostal rib space in the anterior or mid axillary line so that's not it i didn't show you this case to show you a tension pneumothorax right <laughs> so this was the presentation one this x-ray was done after needle aspiration of the pneumothorax so here you can see the mediastinum coming back to to the midline and then also the flattening of the left dome of ma diaphragm has reduced but now we see this small cyst like lesion and we're not quite sure what this is or where this is coming from but the pneumothorax is still persistent so the patient is still having increased work of breathing etc etc they go go ahead and put in a chest drain and you can see some subcutaneous emphysema secondary to the drain but this area now appears more conspicuous and it is quite baffling what what this could be uh, so this patient i'll go back to the history and presented with increased work of breathing there's no trauma there's no other history so this is a spontaneous pneumothorax so could this be the reason for the spontaneous pneumothorax all right so let me show you the ct scan uh, of course that was the next step because we are seeing a lesion on the radiograph we want to know what this is because that could be the cause of this so i'll just take you through the uh, CT scan. So you see this large cystic area now, which was seen on the radiograph. Most of the uh, left upper lobe is collapsed. Some of it is still aerated superiorly. However, the pneumothorax shows multiple septations. Now at the site of chest drain, if you concentrate, uh, you see there is some soft tissue lesion 
which is along the pleura, oh, sorry, which is along the pleura. And you're not quite sure now what that is. If you go a bit lower down, you see some irregular pleural thickening as well. And a bit more lower down, you see another soft tissue. It, it, it does not fit with effusion or lung collapse. We see some more soft tissue there inferiorly. Uh, and also a small nodular kind of appearance along the diaphragmatic reflection of the pleura. Again, looking at it on the coronal view, uh, just adjacent to the site of chest drain, in between the two chest drains, we can see some rounded soft tissue, white base towards the pleura, basically a pleural based soft tissue and some possible soft tissue inferiorly along the diaphragmatic reflection as well. So a bit confusing about what, what is happening. There is a cyst, there is some soft tissue, not quite sure what is happening here. So the surgeons want to know how to approach and what would you suggest? Would you wait and watch uh, and follow it up? Once the pneumothorax is resolved, then you'll see how it looks and then you can guide them or you would advise them to do a thoracoscopy, repair the pleural defect, close the defect where from where the air is leaking and biopsy the pleural soft tissue or you would do a CT guided biopsy of the pleural soft tissue yourself. So again, this is a one year old. This lesion looks quite big on the screen. However, biopsying this can be a nightmare, uh, especially with the chest drains. And then this lesion is just along the inner margin of the rib. So it can be a bit difficult to biopsy this. Um, must be about a centimeter and a half in size. So yeah, most of you suggested CT guided biopsy being uh, a radiologist. Most of us think in a particular way, but, but uh, I think in this particular case, what was done was they did a thoracoscopy. They repaired the pleural defect and um, did a biopsy of the pleural soft tissue. So let's see what we found. This turned out to be on histopathology, a pleuropulmonary blastoma. Somebody had already diagnosed it. Excellent. Um, so this was the original scan and this was the scan after the lesion was biopsied and the defect was closed. And you still see this. So what is hyperdense, curvilinear are the sutures, but you still see this extensive pleural based thickening. And then you, you also see another lesion there in the lung uh, and the cyst which was seen previously has completely collapsed. So this was a pleuropulmonary blastoma involvement of both the pleura and the lung parenchyma. Um, this is one of the presentations how a pleuropulmonary blastoma can present with as a pneumothorax. What are the other cases you can think of which can present with a, a pneumothorax, say for example, osteosarcoma mets, which is again an exam question. So osteosarcoma mets can present as uh, a, a pneumothorax. So if you see a lung lesion with pneumothorax, which is probably calcified because osteosarcoma mets tend to calcify, then think of osteosarcoma. Um, sometimes even endometriosis can have pleural deposits and during the uh, uh, um, uh, menstruation, et cetera, you get sometimes pneumothorax. So there is a cyclical pneumothorax, uh, which occurs during a particular duration. I'd seen one case of this and knowing these entities is important. Only then you can diagnose uh, these cases. Um, yeah. And like some other su suggestions, LCH, LAM, completely agree. Okay, I need to pause. So this is a companion case uh, for this. Um, a three-year-old presented with two-week history of pyrexia and increased work of uh, breathing. So no previous uh, history. Um, and this was one of the initial presentations for this kid. Uh, 
So what do you think? There's a heterogeneous uh, lesion like appearing, soft tissue density occupying the right hemithorax. And if you see on the sagittal, you can see the most of the lung, uh, some of it is aerated, is pushed up by the lesion. So we did ultrasound in this case because sometimes it can be challenging because we do single phase imaging. It can be challenging to be certain if these are soft calcifications or maybe hemorrhage or enhancement. So we did ultrasound, looks like a mass lesion, some intralesional vascularity. And uh, this again was a pleuropulmonary blastoma. So ultrasound was a good um, modality here to say what this particular uh, uh, diagnosis could be and guide further management. So this was biopsied, turned out to be a pleuropulmonary blastoma. Another companion case. So this is a preterm infant. So for every case, keep in mind what is the age of the patient. So this is a preterm infant, 29 weeker with a query right lung mass. Now the beta HCG is normal, but AFP is raised. So not quite sure what this is, uh, but you can see some air bronchograms running through it. You can see some vessels running through it. And again, on ultrasound, you can see there is displacement of the, of the heart to the other side. And you can see the lesion here. However, uh, we could not do adequate Doppler imaging to be certain if there is vascularity in the lesion or not. However, it looks somewhat like soft tissue density um, lesion. So based on these imaging findings, again, it can be very confusing, but this lesion was eventually excised once the patient was a bit stable. And this turned out to be type 3 CPAM or cystic pulmonary adenomatoid malformation. So distinguishing features between a CPAM or a pleuropulmonary blastoma or any other pulmonary mass lesion, it can be very tricky to be honest because these are very small kids. This is a 29 weeker. If you look at the baby, it's this is a very small baby. You do a CT scan, however good resolution scanner you have, still you can find it difficult to, to pick up most of the normal structures, like for example, the trachea and the bronchi or the pulmonary vessels. So when you see tracheo, tracheobronchial tree running through it quite nicely, and um, you see pulmonary vessels also running through it with no significant pulmonary vascular hypertrophy, um, then you should think of a possible CPAM because they might not always have air within it, especially after birth, they're fluid filled. Some of it might look like soft tissue density because of the contents in it. Um, so this, this turned out to be a CPAM. Now the next companion case, again, this is quite odd. I've added this because this is a two year old who has never presented before uneventful uh, perinatal period, suddenly presented with cough, fever, reduced air entry in the right hemithorax. And we do the chest radiograph and then you see this. This is the first ever chest radiograph for this kid. You see this extensive abnormality, multiple cystic areas within it. Also the right hemithorax appears slightly smaller in volume compared to the left side, but there's no tracheal or mediastinal shift to the same side. So we did a CT scan and then we see these extensive areas. There's some fluid. You see there is tracheobronchial tree communication with these cystic areas within it. However, there's no significant mass effect, which is quite baffling. If you would think of this as a, of a lung mass. Another thing you see tracheobronchial tree communication with, with it, but the age does not fit uh, because you would expect such extensive lung abnormality to present a bit earlier. We did Doppler again, and Doppler was not very helpful. We see these, we saw these areas which showed color, but this was not actually color flow. This was done by one of our registrars, but this was not actually color flow, but this was movement of the fluid, which can be seen as color flow, and you can get confused sometimes. So 
somebody raised a possibility that this could be a mass lesion or a pluripulmonary blastoma, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Eventually, this was excised, and this turned out to be CPAM again, uh, type three. So these are the common uh, presentations you can have with CPAM or a pluripulmonary blastoma. Let's move to the next case now. Uh, oh yeah, that um, endometriosis with pleural deposit. Someone has replied correctly. That's called catamenial uh, pneumothorax. Thanks for that. All right. Um, case five. A one-year-old presented with abdominal lump, no other systemic issues, and no fever. So let's let's go through the imaging. Um, one-year-old, no systemic illness, no fever. You see the abdominal X-ray. Most of the bowel loops displaced to the contralateral side. We don't see any bowel loops in the left abdomen. Then a CT chest and abdomen was requested for complete imaging because this was thought to be abdominal mass. So let's do chest and abdomen. However, the radiographers somehow managed to do only the chest, but we had done an abdominal ultrasound where we had seen a large mass crossing the midline, not quite sure if it is coming from the kidney or if it is extra renal, which is very common on ultrasound to be misled, especially when you have a huge mass. But on the chest CT scan, what we saw was extensive bony involvement. One of the vertebrae was collapsed. You see the sternal lesion. So there is extensive bony lesions with this mass lesion seen when we covered the upper abdomen. At this point, we didn't have abdominal imaging. Now, what would you think is the likely diagnosis here? So the first option is clear cell sarcoma of the kidney, Wilms tumor, neuroblastoma, or an infantile fibrosarcoma. Most of you are going for option C or option D, I see. Um, and many of us have fallen for this trap and Many of us thought that this could be a neuroblastoma, especially with these appearance, vertebra plana kind of an appearance, extensive metastasis involving the vertebral body, posterior elements, many other bones. But when we did the abdominal uh, CT scan, there are a few findings which distinguishes a neuroblastoma from other abdominal tumors. Neuroblastoma generally encases the vessels rather than displacing it. Thumb rule. Always remember this thumb rule. When we did the abdominal uh, imaging, huge mass on ultrasound, impossible to say where this lesion is coming from. There are some areas of subtle calcification in it. And then it looks quite heterogeneous again on MRI, but on MRI, we can pick up normal renal tissue running around it. You call this as a claw sign. So this was a renal tumor with extensive bony metastasis. And there is this entity which you need to be aware of uh, when you see a renal tumor with extensive bony metastasis. Again, MIBG was done based on the CT thorax thinking this could be a neuroblastoma, but there was no abnormal significant uptake to suggest a neuroblastoma. And this turned out to be a clear cell sarcoma of the kidney. So even though the presentation is like a neuroblastoma, it's important to do complete imaging and an MIBG in this particular case could have been avoided uh, if we would have done this, the abdominal imaging in the very first go. So. Um, a clear cell sarcoma of the kidney is common uh, in infants and younger children. They are non-specific. They appear quite similar to Wilms. It is impossible to distinguish between the two most of the times. However, if there is bone metastasis, it favors clear cell sarcoma. They don't show MIBG uptake. Now, this is a companion case. Um, this is a different case. Abdominal swelling in a four-month-old child. You see this extensive, you see the renal tissue running around this right abdominal mass. On ultrasound, you see multiple cystic areas within it. So um, 
when you see any renal mass it is important to look at the contralateral kidney other abdominal structures you see any lymph nodes is there any vascular involvement is it going into the renal vein or the ivc so these are the image defined risk factors which you need to be aware of when you see any abdominal uh, uh, renal tumor so this was the initial scan where on ct scan uh, most of it appeared cystic with thick septations arising from the right kidney and this patient was operated was well for a few months after a few months came back with recurrent swelling in the abdomen and you see this blown up disease in the entire abdomen extensive disease not which is extra renal um so this this was a cellular variant of mesoblastic nephroma so what what is mesoblastic nephroma congenital mesoblastic nephroma is one of the most common renal neoplasm in a neonate and uh, there are two variants so the cellular type has higher mitotic index and has poor prognosis compared to the other type and um, they generally have benign courses however can have aggressive local recurrence of metastasis especially in the cellular subtype okay uh this was another companion case um so this was a 3 year old with beckwith widman syndrome for cotley ultrasound which showed a right renal lesion and then on mri we picked up smaller other lesions in the contralateral kidney and the same kidney some of it shows restricted diffusion there so this was nephroblastomatosis uh, i'm just trying to show you a variety of renal neoplasms other than wilms tumor which which are not very common but we need to be aware of this larger lesion was excised and um this turned out to be wilms tumor um the rest of the lesions were nephroblastomatosis which is a precursor now on follow up imaging uh we see recurrence at the original site of the lesion with multiple other deposits in the abdomen uh then this patient was treated again uh, and then showed improvement later on but disease sometimes after surgery can show recurrence just to show you the variety uh, so i think i'm quite short on time now amar uh yes i think we are almost uh, one hour so we can uh, uh, briefly we can cover uh, revise a few things and then maybe we can stop for this time all right sure 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 uh this was wilms tumor um a classic wilms tumor pre this was on presentation and post chemotherapy 6 weeks later showed extensive chemo reduction and then this was excised um according to the sio protocol so let me just skip this can i show this last case this is the last case on in my presentation no, yeah, I, no, yeah, yeah i think you should cover all cases and we do have time i think most people would want to uh, learn okay okay excellent so case 6 5 day old brought by parents irritability and then there was petechi on the chest and face an eventful perinatal period so a neonate or an infant with new onset irritability and some red lesions on the chest and face raises an alarm so um you see the non contrast t1 axial flare coronal and a non contrast t1 sagittal you see extensive subdural hemorrhage extending along the interhemispheric fissures there is some subarachnoid hemorrhage ventricular dilatation hemorrhage in the posterior fossa as well on both sides of the cerebellum a large clot over there um also there is some cellular edema maybe some of it is cytotoxic there is effacement of the sulcal spaces as well midline shift to the contralateral side and then when you look at the spine you see this extensive t1 hyperintensity running on the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord and also in the lower uh in in the lumbar and sacral um uh spinal canal so these are all hemorrhages so there is spinal hemorrhage extensive intracranial uh hemorrhages so 
what would you think of as a likely cause? Is it septic shock, coagulopathy, metabolic disorder, vascular malformation, or non-accidental injury? I don't know why I didn't add non-accidental injury, but consider that as option E. Um, in a five-day-old uh, with uneventful um, uh, delivery, good up guard scores, went home and came back with these features. So most of you have clicked on coagulopathy as a likely cause. So yes, this patient uh, had abnormal coagulation and um, uh, so this turned out to be hemophilia. Um, and this is a very common, uh, commonly mistaken for non-accidental injury. And that is why I've included this particular case, because when you see extensive intracranial hemorrhages, especially subdural hemorrhages with intraspinal hemorrhage, you would think of non-accidental injury. We had done a CT scan. There were no skull fractures, no other red flags talking to the parents. The safeguarding team didn't think it was non-accidental injury. However, on blood test, it was confirmed that this was a coagulation disorder. Wow, I didn't realize I had a CT scan. <laughs> so these are non-contrast CT images, which, which shows extensive uh, intracranial hemorrhage, which I've already, already described. So this is a companion case. And uh, you see the CT scan. What immediately comes to our attention is the uh, loss of gray white differentiation in most of the areas. The basal ganglia, they appear quite bright and the cerebellum appears quite bright. So this is white cerebellum, loss of gray white differentiation, sulcal spaces are effaced. The ventricles are still seen. They are not chinked completely. You don't see any significant subuncle herniation or coning at this stage. Uh, this is again to show the same changes and then you see pick up some areas of hemorrhages along the fissures and also in frontoparietal region, some smaller subarachnoid subdural hemorrhages as well. So, uh, and um, So this was a case uh, where the kid was, uh, kid had a cardiac arrest and um, then was uh, the ambulance was called and the ambulance did CPR, et cetera, et cetera, brought, brought the patient to the hospital, did not stayed on for a few days, but did not, could not make it. But on the CT scan, we see a small fracture here and these hemorrhages are a red flag, uh, which we which we can see nicely on the coronal section. So this was a non-accidental injury in an infant, um, which led to cardiac arrest, uh, and eventually the patient succumbed. This was another case, a three-month-old with sudden onset of apneic episodes and encephalopathy. So again, you see on the um, on the CT scan, you see extensive subdural hemorrhage with, uh, law with the sulcal spaces somewhat appear effaced. However, on MRI, you can better appreciate most of the hemorrhages. You see some areas of restricted diffusion again in the corpus callosum, right parietal region. And on flare, you see, you better appreciate the subdural hemorrhages both sides. So there are subdural hemorrhages of different ages. And this again is a red flag, uh, especially with the presentation of sudden onset apneic episodes and encephalopathy. So, so this, this is something which you need to keep in mind and should raise it up with the safeguarding team. This is non-accidental injury. So this is, I think the last case just to show again, uh, similar appearance to what we have seen already. There's a large fracture on the 
on the 3D recon images. And when we look at the chest uh, abdominal x-ray closely, we see there is an old healing rib fracture of the posterior end of the left 11th rib. So presentation, two month old sudden collapse. So this is a typical history and we need to keep in mind uh, non-accidental injury, uh, top of the differential, always involve the safeguarding team in su such cases. So yeah, I, I have not included a slide to go through most of our teaching points, but Amar has done an excellent job and put most of the teaching points on the chat. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, I would end my talk over here. Thank you, Tejas. Uh, that was phenomenal. And uh, so many, uh, so many interesting cases, each of them had such a nice story and uh, amazing teaching points. So thank you for uh, sharing those cases and uh, taking out time on a Saturday, uh, which is uh, family time. So thank you for uh, doing that and compiling these cases. These are not the run of mill cases. Every time you show you showed a case, I was like, okay, this is this, but then uh, it turned out to be something different. So that is kind of, that that kept me in uh, me and I guess all of us engaging throughout the lecture. So thank you again for that uh, wonderful session. And uh, for those who are watching it live, do hit uh, uh, give us a thumbs up, like the video, and share it with your friends. And if you have any comments or feedback for uh, Dr. Kapadia's lecture, please uh, let us know in the chat, and we'll share it with him. Uh, thank you once again, uh, Dr. Kapadia and everyone else for joining us live for this teaching session. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Omar. Always a pleasure. <laughs> yeah. See you guys in our next session. Yeah. We do these sessions every Saturday at uh, 8 p.m. India time and 9.30 or 10.30 Eastern time, depending on daylight settings, uh, daylight series. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks.